So it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Nora Abel Hussein as the clinical director of the Center for Genomic Health at Mount Sinai. She's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and of Genetics and Genomic Sciences at Mount Sinai and a member of the Bronfman Institute of Personalized Medicine. Uh, her translational research focus is to integrate genomic discoveries into patient care for prevention, early diagnosis, and personalized treatment of disease. Her research interests also include uncovering genetic factors underlying common chronic diseases and understanding the prevalence and clinical impact of genetic disorders in diverse populations. Her work has been published in leading journals, including Science and the New England Journal. Dr. Abel Hussein has senior level pharmaceutical industry experience, served as director of translational genetics at Regeneron. She recently rejoined the faculty of Mount Sinai as the clinical director of the new Center for Genomic Health, where her focus is to develop evidence-based solutions and the infrastructure to enable genomic medical practice in the Mount Sinai health system. And she's leading efforts to return medically actionable genomic results to participants of Mount Sinai's Biome Bank and to broadly integrate genomic screening into routine clinical care. We were involved previously um, in some genetic research and we are um, anxious to get involved again because this is something that those of us whose hair is thinning or gone um, don't know much about and, um, and we need to, but also because I think there's nothing else on the horizon that has the greater, greatest potential to completely revolutionize our clinical practice than, than this. And so I asked one of my colleagues yesterday if he knew what an, what an exome was, and he said, hell no. <laughs> and I said, that's good, because um, when Nora was speaking with us a couple of weeks ago, I had to stop her about 10 times in, to just say, what is that? And what's the difference between a genome and an exome? And so I'm just really excited that um, we're going to get some information about this that's going to enable us to hopefully move forward with some of our research and also to start to include some of um, the genomic data into our clinical practices. So thank you for coming on such short notice. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really excited to be able to give grand rounds today and uh, hopefully uh, introduce or expand uh, some of the genomics concepts that are, I think, really relevant in uh, primary care practice today. Um, so I'll get started. Dr. Kalman mentioned that uh, I, I spent a little bit of time at the Regeneron Genetics Center, uh, part of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. I actually touch on some of the things that we did there that are very relevant to what we're doing today. So I wanted to start very broadly with medical genetics as a field. And I'm a trained internist and medical geneticist who actually trained here at Mount Sinai and lucky to be training at a time when genetics is really evolving. Um, and many of us still think of genetics as something that only touches a few patients, those with rare Mendelian disease, uh, where it can have huge impacts. But genetics has changed a lot, and now we really can think about medical genetics and genomics as a field that maybe could impact every single patient that we start to encounter in clinical care because genetic factors uh, may be underlying the specificities of conditions, the timing or age of onset that conditions may be uh, affecting a patient. Some of you know about a field called pharmacogenetics or understanding the genetic factors that would influence drug metabolism, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. So, something that can enable us to find better treatments, tailored therapeutics for patients. I'm not really going to talk about that today, but that's something that's really burgeoning in clinical care. And then finally, understanding genomic factors or genetic factors that are underlying risk for cancer, for cardiovascular disease, and things like that. Um, and we start to hear a lot about the fields of genomic medicine, personalized medicine, precision medicine. All of these have uh, some overlap. Um, and we'll discuss this uh, a little bit today. So why, why has genomics changed so much? Well, it really has a lot to do with the technologies that have emerged over the last few years. Uh, I'm not going to go in great detail uh, into the various genomic sequencing and other technologies because 
I think that would be a little bit too much for this audience, but the tests that we used to have in the 50s and 70s are still tests that we use routinely today, but now they really are enhanced by things that have come up in the last few years. I, yeah, I wanted to have some shock and awe value here. <laughs> but, but one thing that you probably hear uh, a lot about, or maybe you don't, uh, is something called next generation sequencing or uh, short read sequencing. And then there's long read sequencing or third generation sequencing. And, the, and actually, these technologies are uh, still being refined today. Uh, probably one of the most used is NGS or next generation sequencing. And what uh, Dr. Kalman was also talking about is, is the use of these technologies to now sequence large parts of human DNA. Uh, so exome sequencing, uh, which is sequencing most of the protein coding parts of the genome or whole genome sequencing, which is attempting to sequence the majority of the three billion base pairs of the human genome. Uh, and these are things that uh, certainly exome sequencing is very much used clinically in diagnostic settings in, in medical genetics. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of things like the undiagnosed disease network and, and undiagnosed disease in general, where often at some point someone may uh, try to do whole exome sequencing to try to uncover a genetic cause for a rare disorder. Whole genome sequencing is still a bit more expensive, but starting to uh, also make its way into the clinical realm. And then one thing that I'll also touch on today is the fact that consumers can obtain genetic testing outside of the healthcare system entirely uh, without any provider interface genetic counseling necessarily. Uh, this is something called direct-to-consumer testing. Uh, it exists for other things, but certainly now exists for genomics. And some of you may have also heard of companies like 23andMe uh, that are offering health reports through a direct-to-consumer uh, testing modality. So uh, as we have emerged with all of these technologies over the last several years, we've also uh, expanded our knowledge of which diseases may have genetic factors underlying them and what genes may have traits or phenotypes associated with them. Um, and if you look today at the online Mendelian Inheritance of Man website, uh, which is publicly available and lists many of the genes that we know something about in, uh, in terms of health and disease today, you would see that um, there are over 4,000 genes for which there are characterized uh, uh, diseases or traits uh, related to these, disease, uh, these genes, and over 6,000 phenotypes. Uh, so phenotypes really encompasses disease conditions, risk susceptibilities, or traits uh, for which the molecular basis is known. And this knowledge is continuing to expand today. So we start to think of an emerging paradigm of precision medicine that tries to use this kind of information. Um, and how does this contrast to what is standard of care today, which is to use evidence-based medicine or cohort-based medicine? Uh, and I'll give an example using the pharmacogenetics again. So typically, uh, when we prescribe a drug today, uh, we, we choose our favorite SSRI or, or whatever it is to give to a patient. Uh, and we see what happens. The drug works, that's great, and hopefully for the majority of people, that medication on the first try will work the way we want it to, and maybe we need to make dose adjustments and so on and so forth. However, we know that there are gonna be some cases where there are adverse effects or where the drug doesn't work the way we would like it to. And what if we could stratify patients before prescribing a medication like that to better tailor the medication that we give them? Uh, and that's this field of pharmacogenetics. Um, but we're now we're entering an era where we try to be even more sophisticated than that. So we have genomics, but we have all these other omics that are starting to make their way into healthcare, or at least trying to. Um, we hear about big data all the time and artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, um, and now wearables and mobile devices that are capturing all kinds of elements of patients' lifestyles in, in hopefully their healthy state so that we try to understand a more complete picture of health uh, and then try to prevent disease. And that's really what this field of precision medicine uh, means and certainly includes genomic medicine as a part of that. So the, the big question is, are we there yet? And you, most of you, I think, are practicing clinicians, so you know that we're not exactly there yet where we're routinely using all of these elements of information in clinical care. Uh, but there are efforts to get us there, and those are the things that I wanted to discuss in, in some detail today. Uh, so some of you hopefully have heard of something called the Precision Medicine Initiative, which was launched in 2015 uh, by President Obama in his State of the Union address. Uh, and 
Part of this was to really enable research and clinical care that was using genomics and other uh, big data. And, and one big uh, effort that is underway today is the All of Us Research Program, uh, which is an effort to recruit over a million individuals from across the United States, representing the diversity of the Americas, and create a large biorepository or biobank of all of these individuals with access to their clinical data and then bring other elements of data into that, such as genomics, um, microbiome, things like that, for researchers to use. And this is something that uh, you may have heard of that I think uh, anyone can join, and they're really making a lot of effort to go into various parts of, of the U.S. that may have less access to care to, to represent uh, our, our diversity. So that's one way that we can start to get to precision medicine, and we're certainly not the only country that has efforts ongoing like this. Uh, so I wanted to show you what this looks like today. So uh, biobanking is a, is a really nice way to try to integrate clinical data and genomics to improve healthcare in a research setting and more and more in a clinical setting. Uh, and this is a survey of some of the population-based biobanks uh, in the world today. Uh, this is out of, as of last month, actually. And uh, you can see that in this survey, about 22 biobanks, there are over 5 million participants. They're uh, listed here by year of enrollment that started, and then the percent of non-European ancestry participants, uh, which you may find interesting, and the size is indicated by the circle. Uh, so various biobanks of various sizes, these are all population-based, so they're not specific disease cohorts, which makes them uh, very interesting uh, in, in surveying unselected uh, clinical care or other populations. And I want to point out the diversity, which is along this y-axis, of enrolled participants. And today, we have almost 70% of our uh, patients who are, or participants enrolled in biobanks who are of European descent. Uh, now, there are all these efforts up here that are East Asian that, that are making some headway, so almost 20% East Asians, and then 12% representing every other ancestral and ethnic diversity in the world. And more and more of these biobanks are accruing genomic data. So about 50% today have accrued genomic data, and actually all of the biobanks represented here have at least plans to uh, gain in genetic information, genomic information on their participants. And this is really a mechanism to enable genomic research and personalized medicine implementation. So I'm going to come back to this, but I want to point out our Mount Sinai Biome Biobank, uh, which falls as a little island on this chart, and, and I think that makes us very unique, and it's a very special resource that we have here at Mount Sinai, and I'm going to talk much more about that in a couple of slides, but remember that. So we here at Mount Sinai started a center for genomic health, and we did that because we wanted to explore ways to bring genomics into clinical care uh, to serve our patient population, which is one of the most diverse po populations in the world, as you well know. And really, the point is to try to move genomics from the research realm into clinical care, where it's going to be the most impactful in terms of caring for patients and extending their lives and improving outcomes. This is not a unique effort. There are many other places that are trying to do this, but we certainly have a very unique patient population that we want to try to serve here. And why can we do something like that? And I love showing this slide because it really shows uh, not even comprehensively some of the different elements that are already in place at Mount Sinai that enables this kind of uh, effort to take place. So we have leadership that's very invested in health precision medicine. We have a strong division of medical genetics. We have training programs in, in genetics and in genetic counseling. Our Department of Medicine is very invested in bringing genomics into clinical care. And we have the Biome Biobank, uh, which I'll get to in the next slide. So part of what we're trying to do is bring all of these different things together to enable genomic knowledge and genomic screening and testing in, in, the, in the health system. Some of you, I think, may be familiar with seeing alerts pop up in the electronic health record uh, as part of the GUARD study that was mentioned. 
This is a way to implement genomic medicine at the point of care, uh, and we have infrastructure to do that through programs like the GUARD study. Uh, we have a large genomic discovery engine through the Institute for Personalized Medicine that houses the Biome Biobank, and we're improving our areas in genomic education and training, and genomic counseling, and we have a, a partnership with a genetic testing company, Semaphore. So the Biome Biobank is a biorepository of our patients in the Mount Sinai Health System, and uh, the only requirement to be a participant in Biome is to have interacted with the health system at some point and have a medical record number. And now we have almost 50,000 patients who have enrolled in the Biome Biobank. Uh, and what that means is that these patients have provided a blood sample from which we extract and process DNA and plasma and store that. Uh, and they consent to giving us uh, access to de-identified electronic health records that we can link to that sample. Our Biome participants also give us a lot of information through questionnaires on their personal family history and also ancestral background and things like that. Uh, and very importantly, we've always been able to recontact Biome participants for future research. So we can recontact uh, individuals who are part of the Biobank and ask them if they're interested in being part of other studies. So, the Biome Biobank has actually been around for over 10 years, uh, and it's something that is continuing to enroll patients and continuing to grow. And this is what makes it so unique and why it's a little island on that chart of biobanks around the world. Uh, we're extremely diverse, and New York City is extremely diverse, and our biobank represents that diversity. So it's about a third Hispanic, a third European, a quarter African ancestry, 3% uh, Asian and 7% and other, but that other is a slice of um, the world, really. Uh, we have representation from uh, over 100 different countries from around the world. Uh, and the director of the Center for, Pop for Genomic Health, uh, Emer Kenny, is a population geneticist, and her group has been able to use population genetics to actually define communities based on genetic ancestry within the Biome Biobank. Uh, so you can see some of these are uh, very interesting populations that we know we see a lot of in our health system, including Dominican, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish, Puerto Rican, and other ancestries. So this becomes a very interesting and valuable resource for research because really there's not uh, cohorts of these uh, patients from diverse ancestries with genomic information linked to them anywhere in the world. And one big thing that has recently changed with our Biome Biobank that I'm very excited to share with you is that we have whole exome sequencing now for over 30,000 individuals in the Biobank, and this is actually through collaboration with the Regeneron Genetic Center. And as of October 5th, 2018, we are consenting, we have modified our IRB protocol and consent to be able to return genomic results back to Biome participants. And I'm going to explain what that means and why this will start to impact the health system as a whole. So the Center for Genomic Health, uh, one of our missions is to actually identify medically actionable uh, genomic results in the Biome Biobank and return those results to participants. Uh, and don't worry about medically actionable because I'm going to explain what that means to you. But I want to go back again to this chart just to point out here's Biome Biobank uh, in the middle of this diversity. And um, another way that we are very unique is that we're one of the mi minority of biobanks today that are returning genomic results to our participants. And this is really a way to bring genomic research into clinical care. This is a, a snapshot of some images from our last newsletter that goes out to all the Biome Biobank participants because we really made an effort to outreach to everyone to let them know that there's an opportunity now to reconsent for the return of results. Uh, participants have an option to say whether they would want to receive medically actionable information. We call it uh, genetic results of high medical importance. Uh, and over 90% of our newly enrolled Biobank participants are really interested in this and are saying yes to the return of results. So what does it mean? Uh, what is medically actionable? I, I don't want to get too into the weeds with this, but there are guidelines. Uh, and when exome sequencing made, it, made its way into routine clinical care, mostly in the medical genetics field for diagnostics, it was quickly realized that there is an abundance of incidental findings that come out whenever you sequence a large uh, regions of somebody's DNA. So then the question becomes, what do you return back to the patient undergoing sequencing? 
And the American College of Medical Genetics has some guidelines as to what's recommended for the return of secondary or incidental findings. So these are findings that are outside of the reason that the test was ordered in the first place. And this was all uh, began uh, because of clinical exome sequencing, but has since extended into the research realm and really the same recommendations would apply. Um, so the recommendations today for what what would be a standard to return from exome or genome sequencing are var variants in 59 genes that correspond to 27 different conditions. Many of them are cancer and cardiovascular related conditions. All of them are conditions that are actionable in that there is a medical intervention that, would, that is well established to reduce or prevent morbidity and mortality. And the other important feature is that their penetrance conditions so that if an individual is identified as having a variant in one of these genes, they have a high likelihood of having or developing that condition over time. Uh, so those are really the criteria that actionability is based on today. Uh, there is some subjectivity around this and certainly uh, the list is not comprehensive of every condition that you might want to return to participants. Uh, and also importantly, these kinds of uh, guidelines are still skewed towards European ancestry patients because that's where we know the most genomic information today. So we have this set of genes that we consider as our baseline for a return of results program, and we look for variants in those genes. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about that also, but you should know that variants are classified uh, typically along this schematic from being benign or not disease associated to being pathogenic or known to be disease associated. And those that are uh, considered uh, returnable to participants are these two, likely pathogenic or pathogenic. And what that really means is that is there's over a 90% likelihood that that variant is associated with the disease outcome. Uh, and those results are treated the same clinically. Anything with uncertainty uh, or that is likely benign or benign is not something that we return to participants because there would not be a clinical action tied with that variant. So I wanted to give some examples of the conditions and I think these are things that you are familiar with. Um, so one of the most well-known genomic risk conditions is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Uh, which are associated with early onset breast cancer, ovarian cancer, but also pancreatic, prostate, melanoma, and colorectal cancer as well, uh, more and more evidence showing that. And of course, there's actionability in terms of surveillance, surveillance but also surgical measures to reduce risk. And then uh, familiar hypercholesterolemia is another example, and this is a cardiovascular risk. Uh, where, where individuals who have variants in these genes, LDLR, ApoB, and PCSK9, are at risk for early onset uh, coronary artery disease and stroke, uh, and statins and other lipid lowering therapy are the mainstay here. And Lynch syndrome, which is, I think, something that uh, you're all familiar with that we can obtain genetic testing for. Uh, these are the mismatch repair genes, uh, and the risk here is colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, but also many other cancers. So uh, the focus is not just on these three conditions, but these are really good examples, and I, I point them out uh, when I give these talks because today the CDC considers these conditions to have the highest evidence that would uh, implicate them as being something we should consider in public health and preventive screening. We're not there yet where we routinely screen people for these conditions, uh, but there is enough evidence accumulating that these are probably the top conditions that we would start to routinely screen for in our populations. So I wanted to show you what, the, what does that look like in the BioMe Biobank for one of these conditions, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. Um, and actually, when we looked for variants in the BRCA1 and 2 genes in BioMe, we found a prevalence of 1 in 140 individuals harboring a pathogenic variant in these genes, uh, which is an extremely high prevalence compared to what's known about HBOC. Uh, in the literature, you would find a prevalence of around 1 in 400 or perhaps as high as 1 in 200 today. But that's, this is still much higher here. So we can then go in and explore why that is. And often it goes back to that ancestral diversity of our Biome Biobank population. This is a really nice example because we have over 4,000 participants who are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent in the Biome Biobank. Uh, and it's well known that there are three founder mutations that occur very commonly in this population. 
Uh, and sure enough, in our biobank, we almost exactly replicate the prevalence of the three founder mutations in Ashkenazi Jews, as has been reported in the literature and in various studies around the world. So this is what's driving uh, our prevalence for, uh, for this particular syndrome. Now, the other really important thing that I mentioned is that we can link back to electronic health record information for uh, carriers or, uh, that are suspected to be at high risk for cancer. Uh, and we can see what, their, what is their personal history of relevant cancer based on what we have in EHRs. Uh, in this case, 25% of individuals who were carriers um, had a personal history of relevant cancers to this syndrome. Uh, over 40% had either a personal or family history of relevant cancers. And what was really, really striking to us is that only about a quarter had any evidence of having had clinical genetic testing, so previous diagnosis in a clinical setting for being at risk for this condition, uh, which means there's a lot of potential to be clinically impactful by returning results to this uh, patient population. So we're doing that. Uh, we have a process to return results to the Biome Biobank, and this is how this starts to impact our health system. Um, these are research exome sequencing. So what we have to do to return results is actually turn that research finding into a clinical finding with a clinical report uh, in a New York State approved or CLIA certified lab. Um, and we're partnering with Semaphore for this step. Uh, and we rely on what they think the variant is, whether it's pathogenic or not, to return that result to participants. And what that means is that any individual who has a result returned to them gets a genetic counseling session through our Center for Genomic Health. And I'm happy to say we actually went live with this return of results uh, as of last month. And we really try to find out in that one-on-one -on -one session uh, whether they have uh, symptoms, signs or symptoms associated with a condition that they've been screened positive for. So we get a very detailed family history, a pedigree. Uh, and we tie this in with recommendations for what to do for their follow-up. Uh, who to follow up with, and what are the medical recommendations. And you don't have to read this at all, but this is just to show you that uh, we have made these fact sheets. Uh, this is for BRCA1, the example that I'm showing today. Uh, and we really want people to go back with not just a clinical report of a variant that they've been identified with, but specific recommendations for who to follow up with. Uh, one of the things that we really highlight to them is that we want them to discuss these results with their primary care physicians. So we are trying to empower primary care physicians to understand what these results mean and how to deal with them uh, by establishing close partnerships with uh, primary care across the health system and with specialists that will see these patients who are at genomic risk, risk and may not have the cancer uh, that we're trying to prevent in the first place, uh, but would warrant routine and, and more frequent surveillance. And all of this is really to scale genomic medicine in the health system. So we're learning how do we, re how do we generate these clinical genomic results uh, and reports that go along with them. We're learning how to do genomic counseling in patients who are not coming in for a diagnostic genetic test. It's very different to return results from a screening program like this. Uh, and then when people have a genomic risk for something, sometimes there are guidelines for what to do with that, and sometimes there aren't. And we're working with expertise from within our health system to establish those guidelines where they don't exist. I'll mention something called cascade screening, which is a mechanism by which when we identify somebody with a genetic result, we really want them to share that with their family members. If it's something that's autosomal dominant, like BRCA1, then every first degree relative has a 50% chance of having that same variant. And we have a me mechanism for them to come in and get just targeted testing of that specific variant, which is quite cheap uh, and clinical, so that all becomes part of the clinical realm uh, and, and really can benefit many more people than just the individual who was found in the first place. Uh, and of course, these kinds of screening programs don't exist in very many places. I can think of one or two. Uh, so we need to understand how is this useful? Uh, what is the impact on our health system as a whole? What is the impact on our patients, on their families, on societies, uh, and their costs? So this is all in process. Uh, we're very new, but these are the kinds of things that we're building towards. Um, and I just want to give a couple of examples uh, of what we think we'll find. And don't focus on the details here, but we've started to do all these studies in large biobanks, some here, some elsewhere. And the common theme is that the prevalence of genomic uh, variants causing risk for common chronic conditions is gonna be 
higher than we previously suspected. We saw this uh, in, a, in something called Steele syndrome here in the Biome Biobank, where uh, if you are of Puerto Rican descent, you have a one in 50 chance of being a carrier for a specific variant in a collagen gene that causes Steele syndrome. Uh, and we found that it was really underdiagnosed. Uh, our adults in, in the biobank did not have the diagnosis, uh, which actually uh, could really impact uh, their, um, their health care and, and management. Uh, this is something that causes, for example, uh, cervical spinal stenosis and maybe something that they should be screened for uh, before they're coming to the ER emergently for that. Another similar finding with familial hypercholesterolemia, this is in a different biobank, uh, but we found that FH was extremely prevalent. Again, it was underdiagnosed and moreover undertreated. Uh, and this, is, this has outcomes that are preventable in terms of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we would expect to find. Another example with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer in a separate biobank also that people don't know. So only 82% or sorry, over 80% 80 80 had not had prior clinical genetic testing, which is very similar to what we find in our own biobank, as I showed previously. And among those who've not had clinical genetic testing, almost half would not meet our current guidelines. These are standard national guidelines uh, for who to refer to genetic counseling and who insurance will reimburse genetic testing for. So based on our guidelines today, we're probably missing half of people at risk for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, and that's why an unselected screening program may be beneficial. I wanted to give one case example of someone who has received a result. Uh, this is in the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania's biobank that I was working closely with when I was at Regeneron. Uh, and this individual had received a BRCA1 positive result uh, and did not have family history meeting criteria for genetic counseling and testing, had been undergoing normal routine surveillance and thought everything was fine until she received this result. Following her, her receiving the results, she actually went through the recommendations that were given to her by the genomic medicine program there. Uh, and she came public with her story and I thought it was really impactful because of the decisions that she decided to make. So she was 57 at the time and was raising her three grandchildren and wanted to make sure that she was going to be around to continue to do that. So she did undergo a risk-reducing salpingoophorectomy and was actually found to have a stage 1C fallopian tube cancer, underwent chemotherapy and completed that and is supposed to have an excellent outcome, last I heard. So this is an example of an early diagnosis of something that likely would have gone unnoticed until it was too late. As you well know, we, we rarely find these fallopian tube cancers early enough to treat well. So these are the kinds of ways that we expect that to see benefit from genomic screening and turning that into a preventive health program. Um, and, and we're rapidly approaching a time where this will be more routine. And you can imagine physicians uh, offering genetic testing more routinely in their office. And this is a recent article on that in the Washington Post. So are we prepared? Are providers today prepared for that? Uh, we've looked at Mount Sinai uh, in our students, residents, and physicians. This is an example of data from medical students across the years at Mount Sinai. And about 6% uh, across the board felt that their education was preparing them well for personalized medicine practice. And 36% felt that they knew enough to understand direct-to-consumer tests. So going back to that way of consumers receiving genetic information outside of a health system. When we looked in physicians and attendings, uh, this was mostly at IMA here at Mount Sinai, we found that about half understood enough about genomics to be able to uh, understand uh, personal genome testing results. These are direct to consumer results as well. So we could do better and we want to do better. And if I have two more minutes, I do. I'll show you a couple last things uh, as to why this is important. So why is direct to consumer uh, genetics important to healthcare providers? So uh, this is an example of a 23andMe report. Uh, and if you look closely, you'll see that it's mine. So these are my BRCA1, BRCA2 results. And if, I mean, I'm, I hope I'm a genomic savvy consumer, but your average consumer, I think, will look quickly here and say, wow, zero variance detected. This is great. I am not at risk. And, and that part is true. And this is actually an FDA approved health report. Um, but what's really important is what's in the fine print uh, and 
23 and Me Today is testing for only the three Ashkenazi Jewish founder mutations as part of this test. Um, so for me, who is not Ashkenazi Jewish descent, uh, this is actually meaningless and does not tell me one way or another whether I'm at risk for any cancers uh, associated with this syndrome. And there was a really nice New York Times article around exactly these kinds of health reports that 23andMe, and I'm sure others will follow suit with producing, uh, and why you should be careful about them. And I encourage you to read this. Um, so this is the kind of test where they are looking for three specific variants and comparing them to a reference. And if they find changes in those variants, then you'll have a positive result. But anything else that's outside that will be overlooked by this kind of test. And there are over a thousand of disease-associated pathogenic variants in BRCA1 and BRCA2 today. So those three variants are really important for a very small fraction of the population. Uh, so if you are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and you have a positive result, which is a 2% likelihood, um, then actually you would still have to confirm those results clinically in a clinical setting. And, and 23andMe does state that carefully on their website. But again, I don't know that everyone's going to know to do that. And, and that physicians are going to know what to do with that when someone comes in with a report saying, I have a BRCA result, tell me what to do. But for everyone else who either tests negative or who are not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, so this is really not that meaningful to them, uh, then this is not providing useful information. And really a clinical genetic test uh, would be the proper way to actually sequence the entire length of the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene also use ancillary testing to look for deletions and duplications in those genes to cover your risk for this syndrome. So I'll go back to the fact that this is a changing paradigm. Uh, we're entering a time where lots of lots of data are being accumulated and we're trying to integrate that into electronic health records and into clinical care. Uh, but there are not that many medical geneticists uh, and I think and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are about a hundredfold more primary care physicians per million population or so. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, there are genetic counselors, and this is a rapidly increasing workforce, which I think is going to increase by about 30% over the next 10 years, and that's really important. Uh, but this may be jarring. Uh, there are over 74,000 as of end of last year, commercially available genetic tests in the US and 14 new tests enter the market every day, including these direct to consumer tests. So if you take all this together, I think uh, we're finally at the point where we need to make genomics accessible to all physicians across all specialties uh, to make sure that uh, genomic knowledge is widespread and is used appropriately in clinical care. Uh, so that's part of what we're trying to do in our center and I hope that uh, this is a small part in getting us there. Uh, and I'm gonna stop here and thank all the different people that are involved in this effort. Uh, my co-director, Emer Kenny, uh, for the Center for Genomic Health. Sabrina Sukiel is our genetic counselor who is returning results to our biobank participants today. Uh, and we're all part of the Institute for Personalized Medicine that houses the BioMe Biobank, and the director of that is Judy Cho, and uh, various uh, leadership in the Department of Medicine, Genetics and Genomic Sciences, and Medical Genetics as well. Uh, but I think most importantly, the biobank uh, research participants here and across the world that really enable us to move forward in personalized medicine. And I'll take any questions. So do you, is there an organization like the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force or something like that at a national level that's looking at recommendations specifically around what people are supposed to do once they find out? and what kind of protocols are going to be developed. And also, the, as another part of that is, how close are we to being able to tell people who are negative for something that they don't need to be screened and tested in the future? Because it seems like there's got to be some offsetting savings in order for the, to, to account for sort of the increased costs of testing such a large number of people. Okay. so the. The first question around whether there's a national task force, um, really a lot has been um, in the CDC genomics office uh, to try to understand how we're going to use this. I think there are guidelines around specific cancer genomic risk. A lot of them are the National Cancer Comprehensive Network guidelines that our genetic counselors use today. Um, I think they're coming from different specialties and I don't know that there is a national effort to bring these together for genomic risk yet. 
uh, but certainly something that you could see happening in the future. And then um, your other question was, what do we do if someone's negative? Can we stop screening? Or at what point do we stop screening? So, uh, so I like uh, the person who actually led the genomic medicine program at uh, um, Geisinger and who's now at Yale is Michael Murray. And, and he published a paper several years ago saying your DNA is not your diagnosis. And I think that that's really important. It's another element of information that we have to put into the context of the whole clinical picture. So if somebody has a very strong family history of a disease, but what we know today about genomics uh, gives them a negative result, that doesn't trump their very strong family history of the disease. Um, I think that a negative result in that case just means we don't know what it is, but certainly if your father and grandfather uh, died of this condition, we should probably look at you more carefully as you would anyway. That's where we are today because we don't know everything. Um, one thing I didn't mention at all was that uh, more and more we're starting to understand about using uh, all of genomic information from someone in, in a way called polygenic risk and polygenic risk scores, which are an added letter, layer of information that have not made it into the clinical realm yet, but may help us understand risk a little bit better in those cases where uh, the single gene test is negative, for example. Hi. I was wondering what the capacity is here currently or at any other um, genomic centers that you know of in Manhattan for referrals for that type of primary screening for a patient who you think could benefit from the genetic screening for either Lynch or BRCA, and particularly, especially if that patient is public paying. So a, a referral for individuals who are identified to be at risk in a clinical care setting. Uh, actually, we have a division of medical genetics and cancer genetic counseling within that division um, that for, the, for a clinical referral uh, still is the way to go, uh, regardless of insurance or any other uh, factors. So if I think there, there's a big difference between screening unselected uh, ostensibly healthy individuals for things like Lynch syndrome, like we're doing in our program by evaluating uh, the genomics of a biobank. Uh, that's very different from what you may see in clinical care and you see somebody that you suspect has a syndrome or has come up with colorectal cancer or breast cancer or ovarian cancer and you want to test clinically. There is a pipeline that's the same clinical referral workflow that should be undertaken to keep things really all in the clinical realm. Does that make sense? Yeah, even if it's primary before a cancer is detected? Yes, uh, even if it's primary before a cancer is de detected. We're, we're not, we don't have today a way to uh, offer a clinical genomic screening test uh, outside of that. But that will change. But today that would be the right way to do it. Yeah, we're, we're pretty far actually. That's been the low hanging fruit in personalized medicine because. Um, it affects over 90% of humans will have a pharmacogenetic variant that's actionable. Uh, so we're not returning results for that today in the biobank because it would be over 90% of our biobank participants. But uh, that's something that is, uh, there are clinical tests for actually that you could order. Um, it's not routinely done. I think psychiatry is moving uh, to doing that more for SSRIs uh, and things like that. Uh, but I think it's something that we'll see sooner rather than later clinically. Today, what we have, and through the Institute for Personalized Medicine, we have a couple of pilot programs where patients do have their pharmacogenetic results embedded in uh, the electronic health record. So if a prescriber, a provider is about to prescribe a medication that uh, would not be the best medication based on that genotype, they get an alert, like a breast practice alert. Uh, similar to the APOL1 uh, guard study that many of you, I think, have seen. Um, so those kinds of alerts tell providers at the point of care, which is really the best time that you want to find that information in a usable way, that this patient has X genotype and would be better off with this medication or this dose. Do you want to change? And the provider, provider still has the option to do what they want. Perhaps that patient has been on that medication for many years without any issue then that's fine. Uh, but if it's a, for maybe the first time they're going to be prescribed a drug, they can make a change appropriately. We're one of the few places that's doing that, but it's still at a pilot scale and something that we do plan to expand. Um, 
I'm just struck by the fact that thinking about my medical school experience with medical genetics, which was like a couple of days, mm -hmm. and and um, the issues that this raises are sort of around what's happened with social determinants of health and how we begin to make connections with public health initiatives and housing and domestic violence and all the things that those of us in primary care are sort of asked now of patients. Mm -hmm. This presents a whole other world of um, how do you, as a primary care clinician, understand this information and then how do you counsel people around it? And yeah. so this is, um, and so this is a great start. But what I was sort of thinking about is not only how you are doing this with um, patients, but really educating those of us in primary care, like how to get good at this, and um, and in particular, how do we address? How do you help us address some of the issues that I've faced with? Is some of the ethical dilemmas that this presents? Um, like with uh, is this information available to health plans? And you know, looking at like even an organization like ours where we're self-insured, what do you do when you know? Is this information available to health plans or not? Or if you're looking at this from a public health perspective and Medicare and Medicaid, um, some of those ethical issues about payment. Um, so this raises for me just a whole a, a host of things that really suggest we need to do some catch up in terms of residency education and medical student education while we're educating the public. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with you, and, and I'll just briefly uh, repeat that. I think that the big question is how do, we, how do we get there in primary care in terms of educating medical students, trainees, physicians who are practicing today uh, on all of the concepts and issues around including genomics as part of routine care. Um, it's not easy, and but we're not, you know, we're not the first to have this problem. And and there are actually several uh, national consortia that are really focused on implementing genomic medicine. And part of that implementation is is addressing the the barriers to adoption. Um, so so we learn a lot from those efforts. And, and Mount Sinai has certainly been involved in many of them. Um, we're starting with. Uh, I can tell you we have we have some more concrete plans here with the internal medicine residency program and how to start to integrate genomics uh, into that training in a way that should be expandable across residency programs, but we have to start somewhere. And uh, and then other than that, you know, we're really making an effort to outreach to primary care. Uh, through things like this, of course, but also uh, having identified, for example, a couple of primary care providers who have a specific interest in genomics uh, and having engaged with them and referring our biobank participants who receive results to them uh, empowers them to become that genomic savvy primary care practitioner. And then it becomes part of routine care. They have a result, you understand it, and you uh, make the recommendations around it, and, and then it's okay. And you do that more and more, and we wanna do that across specialties. So we, have, we do have a lot of special, specialists at Mount Sinai who are already interested uh, and that we started to engage with, but of course we need more. Uh, so you know, I'd ask if anyone's particularly interested in learning more about this uh, from your group, then please contact me and, and we'll arrange for some genomics primers in separate settings, because that's what we've been doing. Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, raise the, the issue of overdiagnosis. Um, specifically, I can think of three examples, uh, prostate cancer, uh, breast cancer, and thyroid cancer, where major screening programs have shown massive increases in diagnosis of biopsy-proven cancers, but no improvement in, uh, in actually mortality outcomes, so that, in fact, we're probably harming as many people as we're helping in uh, making these early diagnoses and interventions of people who are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of, besides also, a lot of money going into this particular effort without much outcome. So I'd like to, to hear what your comments are as far as that. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, and one of the things that we are finding, in addition to finding that genomic conditions are likely much more prevalent than we previously know, uh, the penetrance is probably a lot lower 
than we've understood in the past because of ascertainment. So people who were tested for a genetic condition were the ones who had a cancer or a strong family history. But if you start testing a broad population, they don't have those risks and sometimes they don't develop the condition. So we will see that. Uh, and that's why I think using things like a biobank, and, and ours is 50,000 people, but there are now biobanks that are 500,000 people. Uh, the All of Us Research Program will have a, over a million people. Um, using information retrospectively to understand who with X variant actually developed um, the thyroid cancer or whatever it is, is going to really benefit us because it's not one disease, even if it's one gene, you know, we know that there are some variants that cause a later onset of a condition or that are really rarely cause anything. The expressivity is variable. A lot of things, but I think in tying the clinical efforts to what we can learn and research in these large, large human data sets, we can really improve upon that. And hopefully that's the case with non-genomic uh, screening programs as well. Um, thank you for that wonderful talk. I was, you know, we live in such a, in the US, we live in such a fragmented healthcare system. And so I, I wonder if, because it, it seems like there are biobanks in a lot of other places that probably have less fragmented healthcare systems, there's anything to learn about that because I'm just concerned around both people in our country, right, like losing their insurance, not being able to have follow up on these results when you're giving them something that they need to follow for their life. And then at the same time that, you know, we don't communicate well across the varied healthcare systems here. So they could get the genetic test at Sinai and then go to Cornell and never know that they got the same test at both places. Yeah. Uh, so certainly things that we've considered and, and, and are part of our reality. Uh, so to address the first part of um, what's happening internationally, there are actually many global efforts to uh, biobank and pool data and share data. And I think that those things are, are really beneficial to understanding how people across the globe uh, are dealing with genomic uh, information and, and other information as a whole. Um, here, what we're trying to do is, is really build something that's um, small but scalable and really careful and thoughtful. So whenever we are giving back a result, it's an in-person consultation uh, that actually we is free of charge. Uh, so none of that comes to cost for our Biome Biobank participants. We let them know that this becomes part of their clinical care. We communicate with their physicians. We send them to the specialists that we have spoken to about the program uh, that know what to do with it if they desire to follow up as, as we hope they would. Um, they don't have to, and people choose to do different things with this information. Um, people choose to share it or not share it with family members, and that's really up to the patient, but we are trying to empower the best usage of the genomic information with, we're returning. Um, so, you know, we, we launched something fairly quickly in Mount Sinai, uh, and, and we're happy with how it's going, but we're not getting ahead of ourselves. We want to make sure that we do it right. So you mentioned you're not returning pharmacogenetics data. Again, I just want to go back to the cost thing. If, if something like this is going to take off and not overburden the healthcare system with new costs, which everything new just keeps adding costs to the healthcare system, right? One of the, real, one of the places where we could really get cost benefit is to start sending back um, pharmacogenetic information to people because why put somebody on a drug for a year and then find out that they had, you know, a genetic profile that could have predicted that they weren't going to respond to the drug, and that's just huge. Um, and we do that all the time, not, and not, even if it's not life-threatening, like putting somebody on Plavix who's a non-responder, mm -hmm. you know, which could be life-threatening, we're not even doing that kinds of stuff. So why, 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 why aren't we hitting the low-hanging fruit, not just for the cost benefit, because, but it also has real human benefit. And to speak to Joe Lorio's point, it's something that's really clearly known, right? Um, so can we, can we do that? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I should say um, we are doing that. I think one of the challenges with pharmacogenetic information is how to present that. Um, so giving it back to a patient on a piece of paper uh, and then expecting them to um, have that information on hand when a prescriber is, is making a prescribing decision is not the best way, and there's a lot of data showing that. 
so the best way to present that information is directly interfacing with providers. And we have a mechanism to do that, but it's small. And we have to build it for every disease gene pair. Uh, so we are doing that. And we have a, you know, a big pharmacogenetics program uh, in the Institute for Personalized Medicine um, that I'm, to be honest, not, not as involved in. But it's something that we are working on scaling for exactly those reasons. This is something that would affect over 90% of our patients uh, and we can really start to use. So there's a lot of interest in getting there. We just don't have the scaled up infrastructure yet to make it broad uh, because it requires that EPIC integration and, and actually an external data system that speaks to EPIC and feeds the information at the appropriate time. So we're getting there. Because this, this sounds like this would be information that could be in health ex, in, t in the health information exchange. So wherever you access healthcare, that that would become available to the providers. Yeah, that, that would that. be ideal. I was also just thinking about whether or not it's possible if these um, studies are available, particularly to the, the laboratories that um, most clinicians use. Um, and with diagnosis going across to the labs with the specific routine testing, say, why can't there be potential reflexive testing based on the disease that's associated with the, um, the diagnosis coming across to the lab to, you know, run bracket testing or whatever um, based on um, what the, the diagnosis associated with the lab request has been? So that the information is also returned back to the, the primary care provider or the ordering provider to be able to make some clinical decisions about the patient's um, health or decision making. So a mechanism to, for primary care physicians to order reflex testing for a genomic test. I, I mean, I think we'll get there. Uh, really the issue has been that genetics has been very much siloed into its own medical genetics sphere. But that's changing, and uh, many of our specialists are comfortable ordering gene panels that are related to the, the things that they see in practice. Um, and, I, and I know that uh, um, there's a lot of knowledge around some of the things like BRCA and Lynch uh, in primary care today. Uh, but many of, I think some of the issues are logistics, uh, figuring out uh, reimbursement and insurance and things like that, uh, and, uh, and billing. So I think we'll get there, and I think that that's the right approach, that primary care becomes uh, the place where these tests get ordered uh, on, on patients that warrant testing. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, hopefully in the next few years. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm just, I uh, wanted to touch up on what Dr. Schiller was talking about, which was the concern about um, dissipating like the myth or the concern that certain communities will have and um, allowing such information like personal data um, and who's going to have access to that. What are the third parties that will have access? Because there is a community that will have distrust on where this information is going to be stored and who's going to have access. So how do you build reassurance on that when you are um, recruiting people to um, participate in the genome study? Yeah, so that you know, that has been something that the the biobank um, in recruiting really, uh, you know, the consent and the protocol are very are quite extensive, and the consent includes a lot of information about uh, that data being stored and privacy and insurance and all of these concerns. We really try to address, and our recruiters are very well trained to go through that. Um, and it, you know, clearly says in the consent that genetic information may be obtained on samples. We don't promise anything around genetic information being obtained or, or returned uh, to make sure that people understand this is a research study that they're volunteering to be a part of. Um, but you know, now they have the option to consent to returning to receiving results at some point if, if we find anything. Um, but you know, all of that has been built into the Biome Biobank processes for over 10 years uh, to address all of those things and certainly modified over time. Now, when we talk about uh, you know, clinical genetic tests, uh, actually genetic testing always uh, needs consent, informed consent from the patient. Uh, that includes some of that language as well. Um, I, I think the consents will vary based on the clinical genetic test 
that you're sending out a sample to. Uh, so some of them may have language about data sharing, some, some of them won't because they don't have those kinds of relationships in place. Uh, so I think it's just really important that we make sure that those things are very transparent. I think, and, and I, one of the things that I thought was really striking about when we launched the Return of Results program was the enthusiasm for which participants uh, were consenting to receive genetic information. And I actually had a genetic counseling student do a study a few years ago on our biobank participants surveying them on whether they'd be interested in receiving genetic results before we had plans to do so. Uh, and the majority wanted everything. Whatever we got, they wanted results for. Uh, so we really, uh, I think we, we have to give more credit to uh, patients and individuals uh, wanting Whatever data we're, we're getting on them, they want, they want to know what it is, and if it can benefit them, they want it. Thank you so much.